Um, it is a great privilege for me to introduce to you Clayton Childers and also Neil Christie of the General Board of Church and Society. Uh, Clayton Childers is a member of the South Carolina Conference. Neil Christie is a member of the Greater New Jersey Annual Conference. Both have been with the General Board of Church and Society for a long time. Uh, you all can share how long that has been. Uh, Clayton <laughs> has been there, what? 15 been? years. 15 years. Is it 15 and 16 uh, years? So, <laughs> uh, but who's counting, right? Um, they have broad range of responsibilities. I'm not going to try to describe all of that. But um, they have also um, initiated an internship program for seminary students uh, and also um, uh, done young adult introductions to the General Board of Church and Society. I had the pleasure as a former DCM of my, general, of my annual conference to go to uh, a wonderful session which, uh, back in, my goodness, maybe 14 years ago when I first met Clayton and Neil. And um, so uh, we have become um, co-workers in the field. And uh, it's, so I will turn the program over to them and take it away, guys. And people may wander in, so I don't let that bother you. Um, I'm gonna I want to say how great it is. Wow, this is a loud mic. Yeah. Can y'all hear me okay? It's great to be with you. What we are hoping to do is I'll take about five or six minutes and give a brief overview of the board's work intro. Um, I work with conference relations for the Board of Church and Society, so that involves education leadership formation, resource development, hosting groups, uh, training events, a lot of travel to various places. So fascinating work. Uh, Neil is over our unit. Uh, the unit's called Education and Leadership Formation. Um, so Board of Church and Society, uh, a lot of you may know a lot about it, and some of you may know very little about it. So just very briefly, it's the International Public Policy and Social Action Agency of the United Methodist Church. It's located on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. Anybody ever been to the building before? Maybe half of you, so that's, a, that's not surprising at General Conference, but um, it is prime real estate. It is right next to the Supreme Court building, uh, right across the street from the Capitol building. Uh, started in 19, it was built in 1923. So there's no telling how much this property itself uh, would cost us now. In fact, I don't think the church would ever invest in what it would cost, it would be millions of dollars. Even in 1923, it cost $650,000 to buy the land and build the building, which nowadays would be about eight or nine million dollars. So, huge investment. But there's, it's incalcu incalculable, the worth of the location and our presence on Capitol Hill. Um, uh, no, many of you realize that we have other offices of other denominations, rent space from us, National Council of Churches, Episcopal Church, Lutherans, Catholics, I mean, uh, United Church of Christ. So it's the, an ecumenical place as well as United Methodist building. Um, I think we, what we do is so critical to our mission as a church of making disciples for the transformation of the world. Disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world because what we're talking about are issues that affect people every day of their lives. Uh, human rights, civil rights, uh, care for the earth, uh, war and peace issues, uh, prison reform, health care for everybody. Things that uh, you see in the newspaper, and we believe the church needs to have a voice and express our concern in all of these fronts. I know you do that locally. You talk about this in your Sunday school classes. As a, uh, pastors and church leaders, you'll be doing this once you get into, uh, maybe even now as your pastors or when you get into local church positions. We believe this is so important. In fact, I also think it's, some of the most interesting work of the church. So 
Uh, as you work through your career, I hope you'll see this as a resource and uh, a support. In fact, I would love uh, eventually <laughs> to see language that talks about the agencies as uh, an instrument of strengthening the ministries of the conferences, districts, local churches, and also extending the ministries of conferences, districts, and local churches. So the final thing I'll say is that what we do is a unique ministry, but it is powerful because of people like you. Uh, the people on Capitol Hill care about what their constituents think. And when you, they hear from you, that's even more critical than when they hear from experts in fields because it's not constituents. I think when they hear from local church people, hear from Sunday school classes, people like this, I think their ears perk up and say, wow. People in local communities care about these issues. The other thing is that it's not just Capitol Hill. If you, have, if you see the recent um, Interpreter magazine, GBCS is the featured agency in the magazine. We have a 30-page spread or something. Some of it's about the Capitol, but most of it's about work out in the fields in Africa and local communities, not just Washington, D.C. And more and more we're seeing our ministry is not just on the Hill, but in terms of organizing in communities and helping communities make a difference where they live. So um, maybe that's a brief introduction, and then Neil may have things to add. So maybe not questions now, because we'll turn to Neil. Thank you, Clayton. Can you hear me? OK. Um, first, I want to thank, again, Dean Burkholder for the invitation to be with you all. Um, this, your, those of you who have the privilege of being with Dean Burkholder as a professor know that she's passionate about the local church, a connectional ministry, and has a global, ministry, global view of ministry. And I am appreciative of, of that. And uh, she's given us the gift of, of that perspective as a scholar and as a practitioner, uh, as a leader in the conference. Um, I also want to recognize those professors who have brought, other professors who have brought students. I notice that my colleague, Dr. Drew Dyson, is here, and I want to thank Drew for bringing students uh, from Wesley, a colleague of mine from New Jersey, district superintendent. Uh, other professors, thank you for taking the time to make this commitment. Your students are going to be delegates to General Conference at some point. I would like to think. Some of them will be elected as subcommittee chairs, legislative uh, committee chairs. They'll maybe be sitting on the, the commission on the general conference or the general board of church and society or the connectional table, and they may be elected to the Episcopacy. You may be elected to the Episcopacy. You may be charged with, with leadership of this, this kind of a body uh, playing a particular role. The only thing I'd add to what Clayton was sharing in terms of GBCS is two things. One is we work side by side and we allied our work with, uh, four, with three other program agencies, the commissions of the church, and the priorities that have been set by the general conference. We don't come up with our own priorities. We have a distinct board of directors that serve for four years with an eight-year term limit, but the, the directive comes from the, the general conference. And so the purpose of the general, if you remember your polity class, or if you look back in the book of discipline, it says that the purpose of the General Board of Church and Society is to seek the implementation of the social principles under the public policy statements of the General Conference. So that's, our, that's the core purpose. That's our mission for being. Now, how we carry out that mission uh, is, <coughs> differs. And now I'm going to get to the, the, the purpose of, of why Anne invited us, I think, to come and speak, which is the social principles and the revision. Um, if we're to seek the implementation of the social principles, the challenge is what does that look like in an ever-increasing um, pluralistic, multilingual, uh, multicultural, multinational, transnational uh, community that we call church in society? What does it look like? So we have a set of social principles that are the outgrowth, again, think back to your polity class from the 1908 social creed. How many of you remember the social creed? Y'all remember that? All right. So if you come to the Methodist building on Capitol Hill, when you walk into the building, to the left you will see a, a huge 
depiction of the 1908 social creed and to the right, you'll see what's the, what is, was the, originally the 1972 um, social, social creed, which gave birth to the social principles through a committee that was chaired by Bishop Thomas. Um, the, when the church was, was born, from 68 to 72, a commission was set apart to take the creed that had uh, been added to by each subsequent you know, a general conference from 1908 on. Um, they didn't really have resolutions, per se, but they were, they were statements in the Book of Discipline. And to take th this new church, create for this new church a, a set of stable social principles that we could uh, stand side by side our social creed. And uh, as a result of that came the birth of the predecessor uh, agencies for what is now the General Board of Church and Society. I'm going to fast forward now. In 2000, 1999-2000, Bishop Henrik Boliter, who is a Episcopal, retired now Episcopal leader of what is called the Central and Southern European uh, Central Conference, that's this huge swath of area from Switzerland to the Baltic, Balkan areas, uh, to um, Hungary, uh, Bulgaria, all these areas that were former part of the Soviet bloc of influence. Bishop Boliter, who has a passion for social justice and ecumenism, approached the General Board of Church and Society, approached other leaders in the church and said, the social principles are so important to our ministry because they define, they assist us in defining who we are. When we have state churches where we are growing new churches, we're doing new church plants, and where we've had churches established for 100, 150 years as in, in Switzerland and in parts of Austria, um, we need a statement where we can be uh, relevant to our colleagues in ministry. You know, we know what Catholic social teaching says, we know what the state church, the Lutheran church says, uh, we know what the Reformed churches say, but the United Methodist Church as a worldwide church, um, the statements in the social principles are, are incredible statements, they're prophetic statements, they're pastoral statements, they're, uh, they're visionary. However, are they too US centric? Are they relevant for a shifting Europe? And so that was the original conversation. That was back in 2000. Go a few years after that, Bishop Boliter hosted something called the Vienna Consultation. And in the Vienna Consultation, it's a theological consultation he held every, held every four years. It was an opportunity to do continuing education, something that I hope you never take for granted. I mean, Clayton and I do not take, we are blessed in that we get many opportunities, but we've got to be intentional about it, so you be intentional too, whatever ministry where you find yourself in. Bishop Bolliter would bring together clergy and the lay leadership of his Episcopal area, and for four days we talked about the social principles. We did this in partnership with the General Board of Global Ministries, with local churches in the region. We looked at some of the, the post-conflict situation and how they were responding. As a result of that conversation, there was an impetus to take to the gen next General Conference in 2004 uh, a proposal, a petition, to revise the social principles to make them more global. The language we were using at the time was global. Uh, it did not get a lot of steam. Instead, what happened was there was a move to revise the social creed, something that our agency shepherded with the leadership of Bishop uh, Jane Middleton and uh, Bishop Susan Morrison. And so we proposed a new social creed after four years. We sort of tabled the social principles revision. Up and now, now four years ago, uh, board members of, of ours coming from Europe and then board members, excuse me, uh, 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 representatives from Europe and Germany and Northern Europe and Scandinavia, Bishop Alsted's area, came together and said, we now really need to look at the social principles because Europe is, tr is truly changing. It is not what it was 10 years ago. Uh, it, it, the economies are changing, the influx of, of new immigrant communities are coming in, new churches are starting in particular areas. What do our social principles look like so we stay relevant? So, uh, the decision was made, and I'll read you the petition that was discussed, was we need to have a new set of social principles that are global, that are succinct and theologically founded, or perhaps more theologically founded. I would argue that they are. It may not be as apparent as, uh, in some areas, but there is a theology underneath each principle. 
There's a set of values, there's a set of interests, there's a set of positions, but it's there. But to make it more apparent, more uh, uh, relevant to where the church is today. So the petition was this in 2012. Um, petition number 20, if you're writing on this, it's important for you to know the numbers. I'm going to give it to you. 20986. <clears throat> it was non-disciplinary. And the petition is to revise the social principles. And the language is to engage in a process for considering and revising. Note it doesn't say rewriting. It says revising. The social principles to determine, uh, to convene hearings, appropriate measures in jurisdictions and central conferences on the future of the social principles to appoint a committee of adequate size to provide assistance for further work on the revision of the social principles with the goal of making them more succinct and theologically relevant. That was the petition. It was not passed. It was referred to what became uh, what was, I don't have the language, but what was to be sort of the super agency for the church, coordinating agency, which was ruled as unconstitutional, okay? So here it was referred to a non-constitutional, non-existent agency. Those responsibilities were then handed over to the connectional table. A conversation was had by our general secretary, previous general secretary, Jim Winkler, several staff, Jerry Reist, who you'll get to know because he'll be sitting, if you're here both weeks, you'll see him especially this, the, during the plenary, all the plenary time sitting next to the presiding bishop. Jerry Reist is the secretary for the general conference. We had conversations about what it would look like to pick this up. Would GBCS like to pick this up? Uh, there was no real push from outside to do it, except the voices that we continued to hear from Europe. Very valid, faithful voices saying, we need not to let this go. This is the opportunity. GBCS, the past uh, eight years especially, has been increasingly doing work in Africa. We've been doing work in the Philippines for years, but stepping it up. Working more and more in Eurasia and the, the churches in this region. And we took this challenge on, our, our board took it on. The executive committee wet, met with uh, Jerry, uh, met with Bishop Alstead, who served on our board the past four years. And after much discussion, uh, it was determined that we would create a task force, a task force that would include the secretary of the general conference, board members, uh, past board members, persons who have particular expertise in the area of social ethics, um, pastoral care, Christian education, and we'd begin to imagine what a process would look like. We came up with a process, and we determined a two-point process. The first part of the process would be to hold hearings. We realized it is a huge task with a limited amount of funds to be able to produce in less than four years a whole new set of social principles that we can truly call global. And so the first phase, the first phase of the process was to hold listening sessions and to determine a methodology for how we would listen to one another and how we would then record what we were hearing. And I was blessed in that I, I was the staff person that helped make a lot of this happen and with, the, with great work, help from my seminary students and from my colleagues. And so uh, Jerry attended every one of those consultations with us, as did a member of the connectional table. Uh, as did uh, the Episcopal leaders in the region participating, and we held several consultations. It's important for you to know where they are. were. Uh, we had almost 200 people participate in seven areas. The first one was held in the Democratic Republic of the Congo in the DRC. Our attitude was certainly we can hold them in the United States. We can bring people here. We, number one, it's not always the most cost-effective way. Number two, uh, it is a much more, uh, uh, it's a powerful statement to say, we want to look at a part of the church where we are typically not bringing, shedding light uh, to some of the, the issues that are uh, most uh, uh, reflected in the social principles at this time. What do I mean by that? In a, t in a place of crisis, in a post-conflict situation where you have between four and six million people who have died as a result of conflict in the DRC, where the church, and you see this by the number of delegates here, it continues to grow, uh, how will we, how, can we hold a listening session in this place? And what kind of a statement can we make by doing that? So we invited those from each of the Episcopal areas in the DRC and Ivory Coast, Cote d'Ivoire, to meet with us in the DRC. The second one was held in Mozambique, 
which was open to the Africa Central Conference, which includes East Africa, Angola, and Mozambique. Again, with representation from the Division on Ministries with Young People, Connectional Table, uh, inviting other agencies, inviting local uh, leaders, representative grassroots leaders. The third one was held in the Philippines. Um, you'll hear this general conference about the Lumad and the display, forcibly displaced peoples, indigenous peoples, and the struggle that they're facing in the southern part of the Philippines especially. Bishop Francisco uh, has been the leader in, in being in solidarity with the Lumad. Uh, we wanted to be in a place as, where we could, again, shed some light on what are some of the, the, the issues, the, the crisis issues we need to be aware of. And we need to hold, hold the, take the social principles and hold them up to these realities on how the church is responding. So in the Philippines, we had participation from each of the, the three Episcopal areas. We then held a consultation in Prague uh, toward the end of, our, our, uh, end of the year in 2014 for all of Europe. And I would share with you this. Um, in, before I forget, in the DRC, some of the things that brought up the most interest were orphans and the language we have in the social principles around orphans. Marriage, how do we define marriage? You know, what does it look like? Uh, climate justice, what is the relevance of climate justice in that portion of, the, of, of Africa where extraction economy is becoming more and more the norm? Uh, and globalization is having an ill impact on our churches and on our people and society. In, uh, in Europe, on the other hand, the language was more, well, how do we take the, the uh, uh, in many parts of Northern Europe and Western Europe where there's a, a fairly secure social safety net, and then these more fragile societies in Eurasia, how do they work together as a church? How do you have, Ukraine and Russia work together, sit at the same table together, which is something that we did. They, they typically, they're in the same Episcopal area, but they're not necessarily talking about their social realities together. So here was a chance for us to talk about a, cha a changing Europe, a theology that would be relevant for this, multi this pluralistic region of our church. And our final consultations were held in Washington, D.C., with each of the jurisdictions represented. Um, and we did that twice. We did it twice and it was live streamed. If you're interested in watching the proceedings, we have them on our uh, website archive, so you're welcome to come to them. We added a final one because of the Ebola crisis. Um, we were unable to be in Sierra Leone and, and uh, uh, Liberia, but we did go to Nigeria. And there, you're familiar with the, the crisis with, um, with Boko Haram and the growth of, of uh, the use of religion to legitimate violence. Uh, between Muslims and Christians, that was a highlight for us and an opportunity for us to be ecumenical with the Lutheran Church and the Catholic Church participating, but we were also in West Africa and hosted by Nigeria. So it gives you a sense of the region. The questions that we asked are these. Each consultation lasted two days. Uh, there was a brief plenary time, worship, but majority of our time we're sitting at tables like you're sitting at now. This, these are the three questions that we discussed. One, what role do the current social principles play in enhancing the mission and ministry of the United Methodist Church? Two, how much or how well have the current social principles served to empower mission and ministry in your geographical area, your conference? And three, what might a globally relevant social principles look like? Those were the three questions. And uh, we, we collected our findings, brought them back to our board, and I'll tell you very briefly what the, the remarks were as a result of, of what we found. Um, but I would share with you that, again, for the first time, uh, we were not teaching social principles, which is something Clayton and I are comfortable doing, uh, from using experiential styles of education. We weren't doing that. We weren't doing it in a seminary setting. Uh, we weren't doing it with Christian educators. We were really in a posture of recept receptivity and listening and trying to take what we heard with integrity and share it with, uh, with a larger audience to determine, okay, how do we move forward? You know, what are the theological methods that we want to put into place? What, what will be prioritized here? Uh, before we even get to the, the, the process for implementation, those are questions we ought to give some space to, to discussion in. What were our findings? There were four. Number one, 
Reception of the social principles. We heard a deep appreciation for the social principles as a resource for mission and ministry. Overwhelmingly, we, outside the United States, we found that they are a tool for ministry. They're a, uh, uh, they do not, there's not always agreement, certainly, on certain particular social principles of the 72, 73 statements we've got, but they are a tool for ministry. And we have both seen in Zimbabwe, for example, 300 people being taught the social principles as a Sunday school class, where we'll walk into a church and you'll see the, the lay leader teaching them. She's teaching them to the, the congregation. We'll go into the seminary in Moscow and they're teaching the social principles. So it's happening in the United States, however, perhaps it's the treasure that we have to revisit, we have to find again. Because too many of our local churches um, are, are uh, ill aware they, they perhaps have not had the discussions that our sisters and brothers are having across the borders on the social principles. And I think we have to ask why, why that may be. That's a question for us to reflect on. But the, the first thing we learned was that there is a deep appreciation for them as a source for mission and ministry. Second thing is language, current practices, and social realities. We heard described a tension between acknowledging the practices, the current practices of the United Methodist Church in specific geographic areas and the application of the language in the social principles. So the practices, the cultural practices, the um, uh, structure, uh, the priorities for ministry, how do they align themselves with what our social principles are? As an aside, I'll share with you, there's, in Africa, we have organizers who teach the social principles and begin mercy and justice ministries. They can't move forward in a congregation until you start talking about the social principles. The congregations want to know why. Why are we involved in this? You know, we can drill a borehole, a well. Yeah, absolutely, we can build a clinic. But why are we building a school that's open to both girls and boys? Why are we building a school that's open to Muslims? The social principles and the other policy statements, these other theological statements, assist them in that dialogue. And now we're building schools where, for Muslims and Christians, boys and girls in parts of Nigeria, that two years ago were not being built. That's just one small example. But how do you align the language uh, of the social principles with the current realities of a region? Third finding was this, local and global relevance. We heard a desire for further work and reflection to further clarify and reaffirm the contextual and worldwide relevance of the social principles. When you read them, my question to you is, do you find them US-centric? Uh, do you find them reflecting a North Atlantic perspective? Uh, if you read the ec economic section of social principles, do they, do you, th from, if you put on a pair of eyes, you look from the hermeneutics of someone in the global south, do, do they, are they as relevant for you? Um, and we found that there were challenges there. And if we, and in fact, if, and I'm hoping we do, revise the social principles, how are we gonna reconcile different understandings of economic order and economic practice, uh, which may be in competition with one another? And how do we do it in one document? This will be the challenge. Finally, four, uh, theological and ethical foundations. We heard a strong desire for a more precise and concise articulation of the social principles that speaks across cultural distinctions and historical particularities, that's important across cultural distinctions, distinctions and historical particularities. We heard a desire for more explicit theological and ethical foundations to ground every social principle. So those were our four findings. Now, what we've done is we've come to this general conference and our board um, has uh, continued the work and uh, has proposed, as we did about almost you know, four years ago, saying we need to do the listening sessions then we need to do public hearings and we need to do some writing. The proposal, the petition we have is a very uh, succinct one. To affirm the ongoing work of revising the social principles. That is what is the Church and Society One Legislative Committee will consider. And uh, we are hoping that they will, uh, they will support the will of the, 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 the intentions of the, the board, the general board of Church and Society, those board members. Um, we are uh, excited that uh, we can, after this general conference, begin the process of determining uh, writing teams, uh, continuing the listening sessions, perhaps having, um, I imagine this almost as, as sort of a Venn diagram, if you will. Think back to math, geog geometry. 
sort of conversations here, conversations here with some intersection. Uh, involving scholars from our wonderful uh, seminaries, theological institutions, with practitioners at the grassroots level, making use of the best of our social media, getting the conversation, keeping the conversation going, but then determining, we are gonna have to determine how are we gonna write? You know, who's gonna do, who's gonna put paper to pen? And then how are we gonna test that out um, by district, by conference, in a, in a worldwide church? How are we gonna do that? And so that is the, the challenge and that is also the hope. Uh, our hope then is by 2020, when a new worldwide book of discipline is considered by the General Conference, we will have a new uh, set of social principles that the General Conference will uh, read and, and debate and God willing approve. So that's the background to this project. Uh, that's our hope. Uh, and I would love to hear questions that you may have. So I've been talking too long, so thank you. Please, when you have a question, if you'll go to the microphone. And just as a reminder that at quarter till, the live stream um, is turned off, but we can continue the conversation yeah. past that. So I just wanted to make sure you remember the time. Questions? I know it's early, I know it's early, and you're in different time zones, so I know. Yeah, please, JR. So, so I'm wondering how much of what you're doing are you sharing as you go, or do you kind of collect all this and we wait to the end and then you present? It's a great question. So um, I can tell you how we've, what we've done until now, uh, how we'll move forward. I'm not quite sure. I think there's, um, there are pros and cons to both. We don't want to, I think of the primary election, you know, the primaries. The, is there anyone who's from outside the United States? I should ask that question. Okay, thank you. So we've been going through this primary process in the United States where one part of the country votes. This, <laughs> an entire, entirely different part of the country. What happens when they start to hear those votes coming in? How does it influence their, their decision to vote or not vote, or how, where, how they're gonna, they're gonna they're speak up? I think there's something to that. Um, how do we hold the information that is shared uh, such that each area, region, in, has its own integrity and has this opportunity to lift up language based on practices that, uh, that's, that, that can, be, can stand on its own, that can, that can be respected for what it is without uh, being influenced necessarily by uh, another region, right? Um, that said, our hope is not to do things regionally. We're not, we're not interested in siloing. We're interested in bringing the church together. So Europe, Philippines, uh, the United States, jurisdictions, the central conferences, all this work will happen together. So there will not be just the jurisdictional writing. There won't just be writing in Europe. There won't be frame in the Philippines. There'll be cross-fertilization. That's how we did it for the listening sessions. And it was incredibly effective in building trust, uh, in, um, in imagining what the next step might be together. In fact, all this debate on Rule 44, I was thinking about this last night. We were practicing Rule 44 for the past four years, I would argue, in, in the, the kind of discussion we had and kind of respectful discussion, uh, respecting where the spirit is. And uh, again, I'm incredibly grateful that Jerry Reese uh, was in, with me in this process because we had the wisdom that, that he brought from, from uh, having advised the general conference in his role. So um, I'm not quite sure how we'll do it in the future. What we did though in the past was as soon as we had a consultation, we have a limited staff and a limited budget, but we got it up online, uh, unedited. So if you want to watch two days of streaming video from, it's in Portuguese and French and in English, that's from Maputo, Mozambique, go for it. It's there. I'll, I'll give you the link and you can do it. Uh, but you can see the raw footage of it. And eventually, probably we'll send it to archives uh, so that they, they're holding on to it. But we, we didn't wait for the next consultation to make it available. 
uh, we kept it live streamed. There was a reason we did live streaming where we could. In the, outside the United States, technical realities are, are reality. So, uh, but the Washington DC, um, we, we live streamed and the Philippines we live streamed. So how we move forward is something we need to still discuss. Other questions? Yeah, please and then please. Uh, moving forward, well, <laughs> moving forward, what do you think is the, what do you see as the biggest or the most difficult social principle to address or the social area from a global perspective? It's a great question. So I'd, I'd put the question back to you all from where you, where you all think is the most difficult social principle, challenging. Where's the greatest opportunity to, to, to be a church, be the church in, in, in what we say? I think we're, you'd be surprised at what brought up a lot of heat in conversation. Suicide brought up a lot of heat, okay? I hear from, ah, okay, good, okay, you're with me. It, it, in some cultural practices, how do you deal with someone who's taken their life and the effect it has on their family? The state language we have there and now um, is a pastoral, biblical uh, perspective. Um, it is not one that, please remember, it's not one that all churches share. 2016, okay? Not just in the United States, but globally. All right, that's number one. Number two, the cultural practices around suicide will differ. In Philippines, Africa, even parts of the United States. It's not just theological differences, it's culture, it's geography. And so we had a lot of discussion on what it might look like to revise our current language on suicide, on orphans, on uh, food justice. Food justice in the Philippines is a reality uh, that they, they, that they, the, uh, that our, our friends there, our pra the practitioners leadership, would like to highlight for the whole church. If we care about food justice, how is it really reflected in what we say as a church and social principles? And then what we do with those social principles in terms of education and advocacy. So the other issues around human sexuality, uh, issues around war and uh, peace, um, those will certainly bring up uh, discussion, anticipate that. But um, yeah, but there are, there's not one or two issues we disagree on. There are things that you'd be surprised where, where there's a lot of heat. I think I saw a hand over here and then over here. Yeah, please. Um, so in our class, we kind of talked about how um, there's a movement to squish the discipline down into um, one that is like, this is what everyone needs, and then each global place has its own thing. Yeah. So how is that affecting your movement towards making the social principles more global, and how do you think that that's going to all affect each other as we talk about it in conference? It's a great question. Okay. <laughs> So the standing committee, I don't know if any of you were here to attend the standing committee on Central Conference Matters. It meets right before the official opening uh, of the General Conference for a day and two days, but it didn't take that long this time. It was a day and a half work. There was a petition to, I'm not quite sure where it came from, if it came from the United States or if it came from outside the US, a petition to uh, basically make the social principles contextual. So each, each each jurisdiction, each central conference could determine which social principles to change. That was voted down. So the, central, the, the standing committee on central conference matters, those are central conference members, um, were very strong in one voice that no, we need a set of global social principles or worldwide social principles. And I was encouraged by that. Uh, there are some people uh, with one th in one theological camp who have spoken to me over the past for eight years, who have said, 12 years actually, saying, Neil, why can't we have contextual social principles? And I see, if you ask me my opinion, I think that there's a problem with that. We're one church. Um, I think the social principles uh, are, are, can we live together with, with one set of social principles? That's the challenge. And uh, what, does, what would it actually look like if we have social teaching here and here? Absolutely contextualize it, but can we not say 
this is what we have common agreement on in terms of our values, our common interests, and our positions, our public prophetic statements. Um, is that not possible? And so uh, it was voted down by the Standing Committee on Central Coast Matters. That was incredibly encouraging. Um, there is no, in terms of the worldwide book of discipline, the understanding will be that if that passes, uh, if the work, excuse me, is, is affirmed to continue onward, that's the hope, uh, that there will be books of discipline for each region. However, there will still be one social principles. There will still be one social principles. So there's no, uh, there's no petition that will be discussed that would share otherwise, to my knowledge, unless it comes from the floor. We've got time for one more. Yeah, please. So I think that you kind of answered my question I was going to ask, but yesterday in our holy conferencing breakdown with the uh, committees, a yeah. brother from the Congo was saying that amongst our differences, there can still be unity. And so when he was addressing some of the Book of Discipline and Social Principles, he said that our unity comes when we filter everything through the ministry of Jesus Christ mm -hmm. and the teachings thereof. And so in looking at the development of the Social Principles going forward, um, how many of those would be filtered through the ministry of Jesus Christ, or how many of those would be, or how much of the social principles would have the goal of reflecting a ministry of Christ or teaching of Christ that we as United Methodists agree upon through the Wesleyan tradition? So if I am understanding your question correctly, so the, the, the second part of the question is, will, will there be social principles that reflect um, the re con our contextual realities. So will it be, will there be some social principles that reflect your contextual realities and some social principles that reflect a universal, universal understanding? Right, right. Sure. Okay. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Universal uh, principles that we can agree on as Wesleyans sure. or as United Methodist sayings, these, this is the teachings we believe Christ to have yeah. and then others that are cultural because there are those differences. Great. It's a great question. So. Um, in the listening sessions, overwhelmingly, what we heard was a desire for the former, that we would have social principles that are theological statements, uh, ethical statements, where there will, be, there will be room within them to be gracious, okay? There will be room to be gracious in its application. That said, when you look at them now, there are some very firm statements. There's firm statements on gambling being a menace to society, a pestilence. I mean, it's very strong language. War is incompatible with the teaching of Christ. We have several, what do you do with these very strong uh, declaratory statements? Um, I have not heard from uh, the listening sessions a desire to water down a lot of that language, but to include with it a theological language that gives it, gets us to that place, all right? So it's definitely the former, rather than sort of trying to contextualize some and say, nope, this is what's so, in other words, bifurcating the social principles, no, not real. It would be much more to keep it one universal document. If you have questions, Clayton and I are here. I'm gonna be at the booth for an hour, then I'm gonna be at general administration. Clayton's gonna be at conferences, and we are here uh, I'm here for two weeks. Clayton leaves on Friday late night. So. And there are other GBCS staff. Absolutely. Around some of the yes. If you're if you are assigned to a particular legislative committee, please look for one of our GBCS staff. John Hill and Emma Escobar are in Church Society One. Susan Burton and Pauline uh, Muchenga is in Church Society Two, and then the rest of us are spread out. All right. Thank you for your attention and have a wonderful general conference. Thank you.